This problem from the 2024 Putnam exam appears surprisingly simple. Find all positive integers and for which there are positive integers a, b, and c that satisfy this equation. At first glance, it seems like you could just test some numbers and find a solution. But the reality is much more complex. Behind this seemingly straightforward equation is actually a complex detective story, a pursuit involving parity arguments, modular arithmetic, and even infinite descent. Let's start our investigation with the simplest possible case, when the integer n is equal to 1. Substituting n equals 1 into the equation gives us this. Of course, raising a number to the first power doesn't change it. So the equation simplifies to a linear Diophantine equation. To confirm that n equals 1 is a valid solution, we only need to find one set of positive integers a, b, and see that works. Let's try some simple values. Let's test a equals 1 and b equals 2. Substituting these into the left side gives us 2 plus 6, which is 8. To find c, we just need to divide by 4. This gives us c equals 2. Since a, b, and c are all positive integers, we have found a valid solution. Therefore, n equals 1 is a valid solution to the problem. Now, we must consider the higher powers. Let's first establish a key constraint that applies to all cases where n is greater than or equal to 2. For any n greater than or equal to 2, simple trial and error is unlikely to work. We need a more powerful technique. The key insight comes from the right-hand side. The term 4 times c to the n is guaranteed to be a multiple of 4. This implies that the left-hand side must also be a multiple of 4. We can analyze this using modular arithmetic. When n is at least 2, odd numbers to the n are congruent to 1 modulo 4, while even numbers to the n are congruent to 0 modulo 4. Let's examine the four parity combinations for a and b. First, if both a and b are odd, the expression is never a multiple of 4, leading to a contradiction. Second, if a is odd and b is even, we again find a contradiction. Third, if a is even and b is odd, this also fails. The only possibility that satisfies the condition modulo 4 is that both a and b must be even. This gives us a fundamental constraint. For any n greater than or equal to 2, both a and b must be even. We'll use this in our analysis of specific cases. We know from our modular 4 analysis that a and b must both be even. Let's see what happens when n equals 2. For n equals 2, our equation becomes this. We know a and b must be even. Since both are even, let's write a as 2 times a1 and b as 2 times b1. Substituting these into our equation gives us this form. First, let's apply the exponents to get the squares. 2 times a1 quantity squared is 2 times 4 times a1 squared. Performing the multiplication gives us 8 times a1 squared plus 12 times b1 squared. Notice that every term is divisible by 4. Let's divide the entire equation by 4. Dividing by 4 gives us this simplified form. Now comes the key insight. We'll analyze this equation modulo 3. A fundamental fact, squares modulo 3 can only be 0 or 1. Reducing our equation modulo 3, the term 3 times b1 squared disappears, leaving us with this congruence. If a1 is not divisible by 3, then a1 squared is congruent to 1 modulo 3. This would make c squared congruent to 2 modulo 3. But 2 is not a quadratic residue, modulo 3. No square can equal 2 modulo 3. This is impossible. Therefore, a1 must be divisible by 3. Let's write a1 as 3 times a2. Substituting a1 equals 3 times a2 into our equation. Now, let's square the term 3 times a2. 3 squared is 9, so we get 9 times a2 squared. 2 times 9 is 18. Both terms on the right are divisible by 3. Let's factor out the common factor.
Factoring out 3 shows that c squared is divisible by 3. If 3 divides c squared, then 3 divides c. So let c equal 3 times c2. Now let's substitute c equals 3 times c2 into our equation. 3 times c2 quantity squared is 9 times c2 squared. Both sides are divisible by 3. Let's divide through by 3. Dividing by 3 gives us this equation. Notice that 6 times a2 squared is divisible by 3. This means b1 squared must also be divisible by 3. If 3 divides b1 squared, then 3 must divide b1 itself. We've shown that 3 divides a1, b1, and c. Since a equals 2 times a1 and b equals 2 times b1, we conclude that 3 divides all of a, b, and c. Now we can divide our entire solution by 3 to get a strictly smaller positive integer solution of the same form. Repeating this process would give us an infinite sequence of decreasing positive integers, which is impossible by the well-ordering principle. Now let's consider the case when n is greater than or equal to 3. We also know from our modular 4 analysis that a and b must both be even. As before, let a equal 2 times a1 and b equal 2 times b1. Substituting and expanding, we get this equation. Dividing by 4 gives us this form. Now, since n is at least 3, both exponents in minus 1 and in minus 2 are positive. This means both terms on the left are even. For n at least 3, the left-hand side is definitely even, which forces c to be even. So let c equal 2 times c1. Substituting this back into our equation, dividing through by 2 to the power n minus 2 gives us the same equation form with strictly smaller positive integers. Again, we have the same equation form with a strictly smaller solution, leading to infinite descent and AA contradiction. But hold on, why is that impossible? Couldn't we have a sequence of numbers that just gets smaller and smaller, like one half, one quarter, one eighth, and so on, forever? That's a great question, but it confuses fractions with integers. The set of positive integers has a fundamental property called the well-ordering principle. Any collection of positive integers must have a smallest member. Our infinite descent would create a set with no smallest element, which is impossible. Therefore, our initial assumption of a solution must be wrong. We have now completed our analysis for all possible values of n. First, we established that for any n greater than or equal to 2, both a and b must be even. For n equals 2, our modular 3 analysis showed no solutions exist. For n greater than or equal to 3, the method of infinite descent showed no solutions exist. This leaves us with our final answer. The only positive integer for which this equation has a solution is n equals 1. And that's how a beast of a Putnam problem collapses into such a beautifully simple answer. It's problems like these that show the true beauty and structure of number theory. If you enjoyed this breakdown, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. It helps us create more content and tackle even more of these fantastic problems. See you in the next one. The next.